Well, good morning. Happy New Fear. Uh, And this year we continue this series uh, through our Happy New Fear series. It it seems to kind of contradict each other, but we've seen how we are to find our joy in the Lord, and that begins with fear. Uh, Fearing the Lord. Uh, I know on our preaching calendar, today we're going to look at, we're scheduled to look at fear God, not man, and next week, uh, fear God, not life and death. However, we'll push that a little bit weak further. Next week, we're going to look at fear God, not man. As we're going through this passage this morning, I was thinking about this. Before we talk about fear God and not man, this question came up. Why fear God? How does a fear of the Lord lead to wisdom and understanding? In order for us to fear God and not man, in order for us to fear God and not life and death, what does it mean to fear God? And so to begin with, uh, to get that out of the way, first and foremost, what do you mean by fear God? Now, now certainly there is that fear of respect and, and reverence aspect, right? That's included in there. But specifically this morning, when we talk about the fear of the Lord, make no mistake, we're talking about fear God as in fear and trembling fear God, right? This is fear God as in everything must stop. You're paralyzed in fear. You can't move further you're fearing God. This is fear God as in you touch the Ark of the Covenant, you die, fear God. Okay. This is fear God as in he dro- destroyed the earth with a flood, gave a rainbow promising that he'll never destroy the earth with water again. Yay. But this is fear God as in he's promised to consume and to destroy the earth with fire. Fear God. This is fear God as in he opened the earth and swallowed up an entire family because of one man's sin. Fear God. This is Book of Acts, fear God, where Ananias and Sapphira die instantly because they lie against the Holy Spirit, fear God. This is fear God because Jesus is going to return on a white horse with fiery eyes, with a robe dipped in blood, and Jesus is going to have a sword coming out of his mouth to destroy his enemies. Revelation 19 is in there. This is that type of fear God, right? I know it might be a departure from our usual tone. Uh, it's not going to be fire and brimstone. I, won't, I promise I won't pound the pulpit this morning. But yes, God is love. But this morning, what does it mean to fear God? The psalmist tells us in Psalm 110, 111, verse 10, also in Proverbs, King Solomon, uh, Proverbs 1, Proverbs 9, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and understanding. Now, a lot of you may be wondering this morning, does not Scripture tell us that God is love, that God is compassionate, that God is merciful, that God is gracious, that God is patient, that God is all loving? And yes, God is all those things and more. So then the question becomes, if God is all those things, then why must I fear the Lord? Why must I fear the Lord? And secondly, how does the fear of the Lord lead to wisdom? That is knowing God's goodness and righteousness and then living according to that goodness and righteousness. So this morning we're going to tackle those two questions. Why are we to fear the Lord? And secondly, how does the fear of the Lord lead to wisdom, lead to knowing God's goodness and righteousness? Why fear the Lord? Secondly, how does the fear of the Lord lead to wisdom and understanding? This morning, if you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 12. And this morning, we're just going to be in four verses, verses 4 through 7. Luke chapter 12, verses 4 through 7. You can find Luke in your Bibles towards the right-hand side of your Bibles in the New Testament. The New Testament begins with Matthew, Mark. The third book is the book, the gospel according to Luke. If you see John, Acts, Romans, Revelation, you've gone too far. Luke, the 12th chapter, and we're going to be going through verses 4 through 7. The Gospel according to Luke is written by the Apostle Luke, one of the original 12 disciples of Jesus. 
Uh, in, in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, he outlines, he gives his purpose for writing this book. You don't have to turn there. I'll just read the first four verses. He begins the book, and as much as many have undertaken to complete a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Luke begins the book, kicking it off by saying why he's writing the book of Luke. To give an orderly account of the things that he has eyewitnessed. To give an account of the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ so that those who believe in him may know for certain that these things happened. At the end of chapter 11, Jesus is teaching the multitudes. In particular, at the end of chapter 11, he calls out the Pharisees, the religious leaders. As he's teaching, as he's calling them out, thousands gather around. And as it's getting packed, the multitude, the sea of people there, here in chapter 12, he then focuses his attention on his inner circle, his disciples. He focuses and he begins to teach them. Later on in chapter 12, he then directs to the crowd as some people have questions for him. But here in verses 4 through 7, Jesus directs his attention to his disciples, and this is what he teaches him. Why must we fear God? Verse 4, Jesus is speaking here. He says, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, and after that have nothing more that they can do. So Jesus is saying, do not fear those who can kill the body, and after that have nothing more that they can do. So who is Jesus speaking about? Who should we not fear? Who can kill the body, and afterwards, that's it? People. Man, woman, child. Humans, right? Anybody, right? Do not fear anyone. Why? Because all they can do is kill you. How convincing of an argument is that, right? I'm thinking, oh, I don't know. That sounds like a pretty good reason to fear people, right? And that'd be like saying, hey, come and help out with worship practice. The worst that could happen is you could drop dead and die on Saturday practicing, right? Hey, Awana needs help. Pastor Jesse needs your help. Oh, the worst that could happen is that you could drop dead while running around with the kids, right? But that's nothing to be afraid of. Hey, come to to L.A. in Vision, our youth mission trip. The worst that could happen is that you could die, right? How compelling of an argument is that from Jesus? Don't fear man. They can only kill you. Uh, it's, It's like the fast talk at the end of medicine commercials, right? Hey, you have a headache. Take this pill. At best, it'll cure your headache. At worst, your head will explode. Don't fear man, because all man can do is kill you. There's a lot to fear from man. You look at the news, you look at anywhere. People are hurting, people are killing one another. There's a lot to be afraid of. And yet Jesus is saying, do not fear man, because the worst they can do is they can kill your body. And after that, what? As bad as that is, as much as we should be afraid of death, of someone killing us, do not fear man because there is someone else that you should fear greater, that can do far worse, even more than you can imagine. Do not fear man Fear who instead? Verse 5. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Don't fear man because all they can do is kill you and after that nothing. Fear him who has authority That is, he has the power, he has the right, he has the ability 
to not only kill you, to destroy you physically. But then afterwards, to cast you into hell, to suffer conscious torment, to suffer God's wrath for all eternity. What's worse than dying physically is the spiritual death. And so who is Jesus speaking about? If we are not to fear those who can only kill the body, man, who are we to fear? Who is this that can not only kill us physically, but then cast us into hell afterwards? Jesus is saying, do not fear man, fear God Almighty. As bad as it is, as much as we may fear death physically, that pales into comparison to this spiritual death. Because we are all sinners, because we've all disobeyed God, because we've all turned away from God, we are marked as enemies of God. And as enemies of God, there's a consequence to being enemies of God. The consequence of being enemies of God is that we must not only die physically, but then to be cast into hell, to suffer conscious torment, to suffer God's wrath for all eternity. That is why we are to fear God. What do you fear? There's so many things that you may fear, right? I looked up a a, a list of strange things to fear. All sorts of things, right? I forgot the titles, but there's there's the fear of the color yellow, right? Uh, Just things that are yellow, leaves that are yellow. Uh, uh, This floor would cause one to fear. Even for some, saying yellow would cause them to, to, to panic, to sweat, to, to get anxious. Yellow, yellow, yellow. Okay, no one here. That's good, right? But hey, what, what, they, they get impeded. They, they can't go outside, right? Some are afraid of cheese. They'll they, they, they run away from those things. Some are afraid of holes. Some are afraid of, uh, of this and that. Some are afraid of sleeping. They have a fear of sleep. Because it's too closely associated with death. They're they're afraid of sleep because in sleep they don't have control, right? They're afraid of sleep because while they're sleeping they can't get work done. And so thinking about sleep causes them panic. But all of those things can paralyze us. That should not paralyze us. However, the fear of the Lord, this is the fear that should stop us in our tracks. As you plan for 2017 and beyond, are you beginning with the fear of the Lord? Why is this so important? Because the fear of the Lord leads to wisdom, leads to understanding the Lord. Now, now there may be some this morning who, who think that they have a good plan for 2017. You may think that you already have a good and wise plan of how you are going to live, how you are going to construct your life, how you are going to teach your children for 2017. But the question here is this morning, if fear of the Lord is what leads to wisdom, is your wise plan for 2017, was that birthed out of a fear of the Lord? And if not, then is that plan truly wise in the eyes of the Lord? How does a fear of the Lord lead to wisdom? Let's look at verses 6 through 7. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, and not one of them is forgotten before God? Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? I don't know. I don't buy sparrows, okay? So going back, first century, right? Jesus is remarking about how cheap, about how invaluable sparrows are. These birds, they can be bought for a few pennies. But even them that are worth of so little value, what? They are not forgotten by God. They are cared for by God. Why? Even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. If God cares and keeps track of sparrows that are worth but pennies, then think of this. If you are his creation, if you are worth many more sparrows, 
more than that. So much so he's created you, he loves you, even the hairs on the top of your head are numbered. You are not forsaken, you are not forgotten by God. You are more value than many sparrows. What a way of expressing that love and that care, right? Heads up, Valentine's Day is coming up, February. If you've ran out of ways to express your love for your husband, your wife, here's a good one, right? Fear not, wife. Nellie, you are of more value than many sparrows to me, right? Now just, ah, she'll get what I mean, right? Verse 4, don't fear man. Verse 5, fear God. He can kill you and cast you into hell. Verse 7, fear not, he loves you. Verse 5, fear God, he can kill you and cast you into hell. Verse 7, God loves you, God cares about you, fear not. How does Jesus go from verse 5, fear God, to verse 7, fear not? Verse 5, fear God, and then all of a sudden, verse 7, fear not. It is here in verses 4 through 7 that Jesus lays out how fear of the Lord leads to wisdom and understanding. How does fear of the Lord lead to knowing what is good and righteous of the Lord? How does a fear of the Lord lead to knowing God's love, his grace, his mercy, of finding joy in him? Fear God first, then you can fear not. We must fear God first, then that fear allows us to fear not. Fear, then you can fear not. For some, we fear not, having never have feared. And that is a very dangerous place to be. A couple weeks ago, Nellie and I, we got a chance to go to uh, Santa Barbara, California. She had a class out there, uh, so we were there for a week, and I got to join her. And there was a break in between her classes, and so we decided to take that break and to go from Santa Barbara that is uh, bordered by the Pacific Ocean, and on the east side there is a mountain range. And we decided to drive out to a quaint town called Solving, California. And Solving, it's a very nice little quaint town, about 45-minute drive from Santa Barbara. And so we rented a car, and in order to get to there, uh, it's a 45-minute trip. In about 35 to 40 to 44 minutes of that trip, uh, you have to cut through uh, the mountains. Right? And so I remember driving through that mountain pass, and I got really excited as we started gaining elevation. Uh, I grew up in Florida that is flat and below sea level, and of course here living in Plano, it's Plano, and so... I was really excited about driving up that mountain. We started hearing and feeling our ears tingle and pop, swallowing, yawning, whatever we could do, driving up the mountain pass. And I got really excited because as you get higher up in altitude, the prettier it gets, right? The higher we got, I started getting a glimpse of, of, of these deep canyons and valleys that were filled with trees. I had never seen anything like that before. And then we go over another mountain pass, and then there was just green pastures as far as the eye could see. And there was another mountain pass that spanned across waters. But I only got a glimpse of this. I couldn't fully enjoy it because as we got further up in altitude, I started realizing how small the roads were getting. There are all these warning sizes, caution, falling rock. Uh, there was even one big rock, and we ran over it, but uh, rental cars was okay. We ran over it. Uh, as we started going through, there were these narrow pathways, and, and even some, as we were way up, hundreds of feet up on that mountain, as we turned over in the corner, some areas didn't even have a guardrail. Right? And I'm thinking, why don't they have a guardrail? And as I look at it, I realize there's no room for a guardrail. There's the yellow line, and then there's a sheer drop-off. 
And as I'm driving through this mountain pass, my grip is getting tighter. We go past this narrow bridge, and before we hit the narrow bridge, there's a sign. It says, caution, narrow bridge. We found out, very accurate sign. As we're going over this bridge, the wind's blowing us left and right. So many times as we're going up and down this mountain, I'm telling Nellie, I can't believe more people haven't died. I keep telling that I don't know if this is okay. And I didn't tell her up there, but I can say it now. I thought to myself, if I take my eyes off the road for one second, it's game over for us, right? And I'm thinking, if I have to concentrate this hard, I'm hoping everybody else is focusing this hard, too. As we're going up this mountain, I'm gripped with fear. I can't enjoy the scenery. But it's good. Because this fear kept us safe. If we didn't fear this, if all we did was drive up there and enjoy the glorious Beautiful view. What would have happened? We're driving. Nelly, look how beautiful. That's it. The fear kept us safe and on the narrow path. On the way back, I Google searched for a, 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 a good lookout spot. It took us to uh, this cliff, this, not cliff, but, but this mountainside uh, that is just along the coast that you can see the entire city of Santa Barbara and, and the Pacific Ocean. Uh, we got up to this safe spot, this large parking lot. We, we, we parked the car there. And it was only then when we reached that safe spot that I was allowed to, to release the vice grip on the steering wheel that I could unbuckle my seatbelt. It was only then at that safe spot where we had stopped, parked the car, emergency brake, that I could get out of the car. It was only at that safe spot with plenty of footpath and ample double, triple railing that we could get out of the car. It was only then at that safe spot that Nellie and I no longer had fear that we were no longer saying, I wonder how many people have died up here. But it was only after that that we were a safe spot that we hold hands, smile, look out, and enjoy how beautiful and glorious the view was. We must fear first before we can fear not. Fear brings us to a safe place so that we can fear not. Isaiah, in a vision, is taken up to the throne room of God. And when he gets to the throne room of God, he sees the Lord seated on his throne. He sees the multitude of seraphim on each side, covered with eyes, these creatures. Six wings, four covering their body, three covering their body, three used to stay in the air. And they're crying out, holy, 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 that the entire temple trembles. Isaiah realizes where he is. He realizes that he's before the Lord, and what happens? He's struck down with fear. He says, woe is me, literally, oh my life. He realizes that he's a sinner. He has no business being in the throne room of the Lord. Stricken with fear, he says, oh Woe is me. Oh, my life, I am a man of unclean lips from a people of unclean lips, and I have seen the Lord. Isaiah's fear brings him to repentance and confession of sins, and that then brings him to a safe place. Why? The seraphim takes a hot coal, places it on his lips, and tells Isaiah, this has touched you. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin has been atoned for. Isaiah is struck down with fear. Fear leads him to repentance. Repentance brings him to a safe place because God forgives him. 
And once he's reached that safe place, fear God, he can then fear not. Then he can remain in the throne room. He can then hear from the word of God. He can then bask in the glory of God. We must fear God because it keeps us on the narrow path. We must fear God because in that fear, it brings us to a place of repentance, to bring us to a place that is safe. As enemies of God, if we confess our sins, our sins will be forgiven. We're no longer enemies of God, but in Christ, we're children of God. And that is that safe place to take part in Christ's inheritance, to be his sons and daughters, to inherit eternal life here, now, and forevermore. Fear God first, then we can fear not. Verse 7, why even the hairs of your head are all numbered, fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. We cannot know God's love. We cannot know God's grace, his mercy, his compassion if we have not first feared As we wrap up this morning then, two application points that I want us to focus on. For us to not only be hearers of God's word, to not only know what God's word says, but what do we do afterwards? How can we be doers of God word, God's word as well? So what are we to do in light of scripture this morning? If we are to fear God and then to fear not, let's break that into two parts. First, do you fear God? Again, going back to the plans that you have made for 2017 and beyond. You might look and say, well, hey, I think my plans are good. I think my plans are righteous. I think that my plans are the best for my life, my family's life, for my children's life. I believe that I have a plan that is to bless God and to be blessed by God. Where did that plan come out from? Did you first fear the Lord? In order to get wisdom, we must fear the Lord. And so whatever you're calling a wise decision, whatever you're calling a wise plan for 2017, if it is not and has not been born out of fear of the Lord, then I believe it stands to question whether or not those plans are wise indeed. I encourage you then, brothers and sisters in Christ. I encourage you then, for those who do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, to first take that first step. To re-examine your life. Because if we do not fear God first and foremost, then we set out on a very dangerous path. A path that leads to death and destruction. A path that not is celebrating and obeying God, but it may very well indeed be a path and a plan that is to celebrate sin, to satisfy the flesh instead of God's will and God's plan for your life. First application point this morning, examine for yourselves, do you fear the Lord? Do you fear the Lord? When you examine and you relate with who God is, has that caused you to tremble in fear? Has that paralyzed you to stop and pause and to examine your life and to call you to repentance before moving forward? If you have never known Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I pray, Holy Spirit, convict the hearts of those who do not know you. That you would repent and believe so that you may be saved, so that you may have a heart of wisdom. For those who have already said to Christ as a personal Lord and Savior, on this side of eternity, will continue to struggle with sin. And so it bears to continually be reminded to think for yourselves, to continually reflect on the fear of the Lord, and to examine, are you living in unrepentant sin? Pray for 2017. Pray to God that he'll reveal what it is that you need to surrender in your life. 
What are some strongholds? What are some things that you're not willing to give up in order to fulfill the Great Commission, in order to be followers of Jesus Christ? Secondly, application number two. Once you have feared God, secondly, can you now fear not? Can you now know God's love, his grace, his mercy, that joy? Can you now be satisfied in the Lord? How do you know if you are or not? If you fear God, now you can fear not. If you truly fear God, then is the joy of Christ in you. Are believers of Jesus Christ happy, joyful? Are they throwing a celebration everywhere they go because their eternity is secure? Uh, in our Wednesday night uh, small group, uh, Matthew, he, he's been leading us through John Piper's uh, book, Don't Waste Your Life. Um, and we went through our second chapter last week, and, and, and one part really hit me. Uh, Piper was relaying the struggle that he had, trying to connect two dots. He was trying to say this. Piper was saying, he seen for a long time, he had to decide between two. He had to decide between knowing the glory of the Lord or having joy and satisfaction in God's glory, right? It seemed like he had to make a decision. Either you can know God's glory, or you are to have joy in God. And that struck a chord with me, right? It seemed like there, there's two camps. Either you know a lot about God and his glory, or you don't really know about God's glory, and you're just really happy about God. And that struck a chord because of how I grew up. Uh, going to church with my parents, uh, seeing that older generation, grow up with church with my parents, maybe even at home, it, it seemed like this. It almost felt like to me as a kid looking at them, it almost looked like whoever was more pious, whoever was the holier Christian, you could tell whoever was more pious based on whoever looked the saddest, right? It felt like me going to church every Sunday, sitting there. It almost looked like it was a competition between the adults of who could look the most miserable in the Lord, right? Whoever bowed their heads the lowest, whoever cringed the most during prayer, they were good Christians, right? Don't you dare talk about happiness. Don't you dare talk about joy. That's rebellious talk. And there seemed like when I was growing up, there's this other camp. There's those people just talking about missions and those people talking about how happy they were. But as Piper rightly concludes, it's not one or the other. It's not either or. It's both and. That fearing the Lord, knowing who God is, that has to be, that must be accompanied with the joy of the Lord. That we must first fear God and then move on to fear not and to experience his glory. If you are a believer and you have feared God, application this morning, examine what is it that's keeping you from that fear not aspect, experiencing God's joy. The onion, it's a... Um, kind of fake news, satire, um, column, article, public, not publication. Uh, but, but The Onion, they, they write these, these fake news articles, and basically it's satire, and it's funny because it makes good observations, right? And they had one uh, article, and the headline was this, right? It says, explanation of board game rules peppered with reassurances that it will be fun. Right? So let's read that again. Explanation of board game rules peppered with reassurances that it will be fun. Right. And it's got a picture of someone explaining a complicated board game and everybody sitting around face palming, right? How have you, you've been there, right? Maybe hanging out with friends and, and they bring out a new game. Hey, you got to learn this new game. It's really fun. Right? And as they take out the pieces, it's just getting more and more complicated, right? Then you got, it's going to be fun though. It's going to be fun though. Right? I've been there. I've been to game parties and the game comes out 
And we're explaining the game for 30, 45 minutes. We're setting up the game for an hour, and it's peppered with reassurances. It's going to be fun. But why is no one having fun? No one is having fun because all they're hearing about is how fun the game is going to be, but nobody is playing the game. It's important to receive instruction. Don't get me wrong. It's very important to be in-depth and to understand how to play the game. But perhaps the reason you have feared God, but you do not fear not, perhaps the reason you are not experiencing joy is because you come here Sunday. Throughout the week, on the radio, you hear sermons, you have Bible study. And it's just getting week in, week out of instruction. Make disciples, peppered in with, it's going to be fun, it's going to be worth it. Right? Go to the nations, peppered with, it's going to be worth it, it's going to be fun. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, trust me, it's going to be fun. It's going to be worth it. Teaching them all that Christ has commanded us to do. It's going to be worth it. Brothers and sisters, PCAC, if we're not having joy in being followers of Jesus Christ, if we're not experiencing his love, his grace, his mercy, if we're not experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit to transform not only our lives, but everybody else's, it may be because all we're doing is listening to instruction, but we're never going out and playing the game. Application number two, then. To reflect and examine on that, I want us to think about this. For 2017, for us to have this joy, to know God's love, his grace and mercy, that's going to come not from us keeping to ourselves, not from us just being here comfortable, but we're going to see God's love. We're going to see his grace, his mercy. We're going to see his power. And that's going to excite us when we go out and share the good news of Jesus Christ. When we go out and we see the lives of our friends, our family members, our neighborhood, those around the world being transformed in the name of God. You have received instruction week in and week out, day in and day out. I encourage you to think about this. How are you going to pair that instruction with actually going out and playing the game, actually going out and making disciples? My fear and my dread is this. That a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, 20, 30, however long the Lord gives us together, my fear is this that at the end of the road, we look back and we just see how comfortable we've been. And we look back and we see how we failed to fulfill the Great Commission. We look back. And we see a stellar Sunday morning attendance. We look back and we see a good family fellowship, Wednesday night small group attendance. But we look back and nowhere can we see where we've made disciples. Nowhere can we see where we've been Christ's witnesses here, near, far to the ends of the earth. Fear God, then we can fear not. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, there's so many things for us to fear. There are fears that are debilitating, fears that are paralyzing. 
There's so many reasons to fear those around us. Where there's their hatefulness, their persecution. We could be bullied, we could be made fun of. We would fear losing whatever reputation we might have at home, school, or at work. And even as far as Jesus Christ, there's so much to fear. Because you've promised us that it's not going to be easy. That we've inherited Christ's inheritance. For many of us, that may be to suffer and to die for the gospel. But Lord, you've promised us that it's worth it. You've promised us that we exchange what is temporary, what's not even ours to begin with, our lives here on this earth, and to receive the free gift of eternal life. Heavenly Father, I pray that the one thing we need to fear is to fear God. That we would have a tremendous paralyzing, earth-shattering, life-changing fear that as sinners we're condemned to death. That God has the authority not only to kill our bodies, but then afterwards to throw us into hell. To suffer conscious torment for all eternity. And I pray that that fear would bring us to a safe place, a place of repentance in the forgiveness of sins. To be no longer enemies of God, to be children of God. For we can fear not. Holy Father, I pray that you make us wise to know what is good and righteous in your eyes and that we would live according to that goodness and righteousness. For those of you this morning who have feared the Lord, are you now then wise? Are you now living according to the goodness and righteousness of our Heavenly Father? Holy Spirit, I pray that you would show us the way. Teach us what it is to be followers of Jesus Christ that the Great Commission is for each and every believer to follow. That you reveal to us how we are to fulfill that in our lives. That we would not seek comfort. That we would not seek the approval of man. But Heavenly Father, we ask and pray that we would obey you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand and continue to worship our Lord this morning.